What's orange and sounds like a parrot? A carrot. A carrot is what's orange and sounds like a parrot. So let's, let's kick this off. Of the theme of comic relief, yes. Here we go. Oh, they like it. Cool. Thanks, Marie. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the conference. Thank you for sticking it out with us, which hopefully make it a fun time. Um, we're here talking about uh, Cloud Foundry and Comic Relief and Red Nose Day with uh, representatives from the customer side, with um, Comic Relief, with the IS side, with GCP, with the developer perspective and with uh, the operator perspective. And uh, the things we're going to hit on here are around running a mission critical app that took massive scale over the course of the event, uh, moving from a monolith to a microservice, uh, microservices architecture, and just the general good outcomes that, that came about for comic relief through this experience. Um, we can introduce our panel or a little fireside chat here, maybe starting off with you go, you go to Mike. Uh, I'm Zenon Hanik. I'm the CTO of Comic Relief. Hey, my name is Ben Dodd. I'm from uh, Armacuni. Uh, we uh, help people deploy and use Cloud Foundry, and we also ran some of the training here. My name is Marie Cosgrove Davies. I'm a PM on Pivotal's Cloud Ops team. Uh, Jay Marshall, Google Cloud Platform. I've been working on a lot of the integrations between Google Cloud Platform and Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And I'm Evan Willey. I run uh, program management for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, so, kicking it off, uh, Zenon, could you tell us a little bit about uh, some background on Comic Relief and on Red Nose Day for the American audience that isn't as familiar? Yeah, so Comic Relief uh, was a charity that started 30 years ago by Richard Curtis, who was the um, kind of uh, director of Four Weddings and a Funeral and Love Actually, uh, in response to the famine in Ethiopia in the 80s. And essentially, we have a mission to bring about a just world free from poverty. And we believe that uh, creating change through the power of entertainment. Essentially, what we have is created this institution called Red Nose Day, which happens once every two years in the UK. And it's a kind of six to eight week campaign and culminates with kind of one night of TV where we show some great comedy, show some powerful videos of what of uh, how the money we spend changes people's lives and basically get the whole country to kind of partake in, in, in donating. Great. And... and this is a, a pretty big event. What's the kind of scale that you generally run at at this point? So we kind of scale to uh, take donations across kind of uh, both S uh, via SMS, via text, online, and via about 10,000 kind of call center agents. And so we, we uh, kind of build to, to cope with kind of peaks of about 500 donations a second. So that's, that's completing donations a second. Um, the challenge that we have is that as a kind of yearly event, we have a yearly feedback loop and we have absolutely zero traffic year round. We get a little bit of traffic in the kind of six to eight weeks before the campaign. And then we get once a year uh, event. I um, was feeling, always feel quite 
stressed by that and a difficult challenge, but then I was talking to someone from the British Office, Na Office of National Statistics, and they have a 10-year cycle, because they run a census once every 10 years, so that made me feel slightly better. That's a long feedback loop. Uh, how did you tackle that challenge prior to uh, working with Cloud Foundry as your platform? So uh, originally when uh, we moved online, we built an online donations uh, application, which was built in Java, and it was uh, a kind of a, a, a real monolith. And uh, the thing about it was that like with a yearly feedback loop, we just put it away in the cupboard, it would gather dust, and a, a year later we'd kind of bring it out and brush it together. The challenge was that we had some great technology partners, one who'd lend us a load of kit, it'd get delivered. Usually it was due around November. It wouldn't come, it'd come in January, and then we only had a few, a few kind of uh, months before our kind of event, which happens in March. And then we'd have to get together like 10, 12 technology partners, you know, the RDBS providers, the kind of the, the networking people, and get kind of 30 or 40 people kind of working together intensely for a period of, uh, of weeks to try and pull this thing together. And it was essentially a snowflake, you know, uh, all held together with kind of the human glue of experience of people of, who put it together the year before. You know, you get problems, this problem's happened, people would remember what they did a year ago and kind of fix it. And it was really not very agile, not very responsive, the kind of feed, feedback loop to be able to kind of uh, scale it up, build it, test it, if something needed to change, it would be kind of another two, three days of, of going through that whole kind of test cycle. So really, it was very, uh, very challenging. We couldn't make a lot of changes to it because there was a lot of risk around it. So we made the minimum amount of changes and then just kind of held our fingers and, and kind of hoped. And then in 2011, we had a, a, a massive campaign and the response rate was really huge. And we'd been kind of doubling the amount of people who were coming online and donating uh, between each campaign and we really hit the edges of it and it came very close to kind of failing just simply because of the scale of the response that we got. So we realized that we needed to rebuild and so we went back to the, uh, to the drawing board. And at, at that point you went to the cloud, right? So what was the, the impetus for, for making that change? Um, I mean, the main impetus is not having to wait around for trucks to deliver service <laughs> that someone has lent you. But really, I mean, we could almost our use case is almost the cloud was almost built for us. You know, we've got nothing year round, and then we have that one spike that we need to cope with. So the ability to scale up uh, uh, that was just was just perfect, perfect for us. Uh, and I, I believe you also use multiple clouds at this point, and, and what's the motivation behind that? So I think well, when we rebuilt the app, we had a couple of motivations. One was would was be to ultimately be unlimited by technology. So we want the technology to be able to scale to whatever level of kind of traffic the, the campaign built up to. The other one was to avoid vendor locking. With the old platform, I mean, it was great. You had 10 to 12 really, uh, you know, large scale software, com software and hardware companies supporting us, giving their time for free to us because who we were, and that's fantastic. But then you're always relying on that ca uh, carrying on. And then as the kind of market evolved and people bought people, whereas a company used to do one part of it, they all wanted to do all of the parts and it just became a very, complex kind of uh, arrangement to, to manage them. So we wanted to be completely uh, not tied into any technology provider and be able to move around as we could. We also wanted to minimize our exposure to PCI and really we wanted to kind of adopt kind of modern modern development patterns, be able to be agile and be able to move to move quickly. So, so Ben, your team and company helped with that transformation and with building that app. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, sure. It's been an interesting ride, that's for sure. Um, so back in, um, I think, June 2012, we um, we decided that we were going to form a team and we were going to pitch to Comic Relief um, to try and uh, improve on on what they currently had. Um, and we were awarded that work. And, um, you know, it was a very uncertain time for Comic Relief. They'd had this platform that had worked for a long time. It was taking a huge amount of their revenue every year. Um, so I think one of the really important first things we did is that we arranged with the board of Comic Relief that we were going to come back and demo what we had done every two weeks, every month, not do a PowerPoint deck of what it could do, you know, actually go in, in front of the board and, and demonstrate what we're going to do. And you know, the choice of technology was a very important part of, um, of doing that. Um, and then I think um, looking at the existing app, and I think this is also borne out by the experience that we have going into other enterprises, is that we didn't accept the premise of the current application. We didn't look at the current application and said it had, um, it worked like this, it had a central data store, it had these apps deployed in this configuration. It was, you know, we have this, this problem, how can we best solve it? Um, so one of the key parts of that was that we chose availability over consistency. So we realized that it wasn't important to Comic Relief that they had a very up-to-date, accurate, ACID compliant view of how many people had donated, what the current state of play is. The most important thing for them is that they'd taken all the money. And if we 
come back an hour later or a day later and report on that progress, um, you know, that would be fine as long as we took all the money. Obviously, we don't want that situation either, but really the, the first um, thought has always got to be availability. Um, and then we went on to say that um, we want to build everything um, on the premise that it will fail. So every component of the stack, we want more than one. So more than one payment provider, more than one IaaS, ideally more than one PaaS, more than one programming language. Um, so through the whole stack, we ended up with sort of a matrix that we would have to have, um, there'd be 16 major elements and 15 of those could fail. You know, payment providers, regions, infrastructure providers, all of that could happen and we would still take all of that money. Um, and then I think also one of the key things is that we chose microservices to do this and we actually chose microservices. And a lot of times um, when people try to replicate this experience, you say, oh, we've done something similar. Um, you know, what is a microservice? And I don't think a lot of the time people are really implementing true microservices. So this is things like that we can deploy individual microservices. Um, so when we want to do changes, we can very quickly change the system. We can do continuous delivery, all these sorts of things. Um, and also that we've got our test pyramid right. Um, a lot of the time, I think, and I learned this on this project, is that end-to-end um, -end testing is not the only way to test. So with these sort of complex um, systems and when they're distributed over multiple, multiple IaaSes and these sorts of things, if you've got a testing approach that says, the only way that I can assert that this works is end-to-end -end testing of, of everything. And that becomes really difficult when you've got lots of payment providers. So an end-to-end -end test is actually in every single environment, I've got to test every single route, call center and live public, all the way to the payment provider every time. And that means your pipeline is gonna be six hours a day instead of the sort of 20 minutes, half an hour that we want to end up with. Um, so in terms of the platform, we have multiple foundations. Um, so we tend to have, we tend to call them shards, but they're just foundations. Uh, and we have three front end foundations and each of those foundations could take all of the traffic. So they can all take 500 donations a second. Um, if all the others fall, fall away, we'll still be able to satisfy Comic Relief's need to take all of that money um, and that's extremely important. And then all the data from those shards feeds into another foundation, which is our management shard. So at that point, we're using deltas and event sourcing to, to feed data back into that management shard. And at that point, they're reconstituted and then Comic Relief can get on a view of, of what's happening. So we can lose all those front-end shards. We can also lose the management shard because all we're gonna do at that point is set all the queues back to the beginning on the edge shards, replay them to a new management shard, and at that point, we then get a consistent view of that data. Um, the platform is made up of 28 microservices distributed globally, um, event sourced, um, and also what was important was that um, we were always optimizing for synchronous payments. So we wanted people to be able to give their money and then get instant feedback. Because um, a lot of the time, sort of nine o'clock on a Friday when the show is on, um, people are drunk. Um, and they're drunk in lots of different ways. So a few people are probably drunk, but also they've been watching some really powerful films and they've also had a campaign that's been going on for a month or two. So when they're there and they're actually typing their credit card details, you know, people are, are generally quite emotional. So we see like a really high failure rate on people being able to type in 16 numbers in a row. Um, so it's really important that they get that feedback to say, uh-oh, that didn't work, so that, because if we send them an email on Monday morning and say, please come back, then we're gonna go, oh, well, $50 or, or 50 pounds seems like a lot of money now, maybe I won't do that. Um, Cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's yeah that, sounds, that sounds amazing. And so you're you're doing this on PCF today. And what what brought you to, to that choice as your kind of platform of choice for the event? Um, so I think initially one of the, the huge drivers was developer velocity. So that's the same with everyone. So when we did that initial pitch and we knew we were going to have to come back in two weeks or a month and demonstrate to the board that we'd made some real progress, um, it meant that on day one, we could use a public implementation of, of Cloud Foundry. At that time, it was cloudfoundry.com. Um, now, you know, run.pivotal.io. So very quickly, we could, uh, we could do that. Um, and also, we got sort of multi-cloud for free. I think... Um, we were doing multi-cloud before we realized, before the marketing people told us. Um, so very quickly, we had it deployed to vSphere, we had it deployed to, to public cloud providers, so that was great. Um, and also, we've been running this platform for, it'll be our sixth year next time, and that, the contract that we have with Cloud Foundry 
has changed by one character or three. So originally it was VMC push, now it's CF push. And genuinely that is our change over that entire period. So managing this platform over that whole period has been an incredibly easy thing to do. Um, and we've also reduced our, um, our headcount dramatically. So the original platform would take 50 or so people as Xenon described, um, and now it takes six. And that's a, a huge thing. Um, and I think what's also important is that PCF and, and Bosch allows us to continuously deliver everything. So we deliver the apps, we deliver the platforms, um, and that's a really huge, huge part for us. You were mentioning when we were outside a minute ago, the tests that you run when you do those, that continuous delivery. Would you mind like describing that, that security and uh, test suite that you're, you're running with every uh, push of, that, of the platform? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're in the situation where we, um, we do continuous deployment. So every commit that we do is a release candidate and that can flow to production and that can flow to production on the night. So when we need to make those changes, uh, when we get feedback, um, that can happen. So um, we have a load of tests that are asserting that it's working with the payment providers, but we're also testing that, um, you know, we have security in that pipeline, we have um, load testing in that pipeline. Um, so that whole end-to-end -end experience is tested every time we commit um, and the ability to, to scale up platforms, do those tests and scale them down and not cost everyone a lot of money is a, a really huge win. Awesome. Uh, and, and Marie, from the operator's perspective, this, this time around with the last uh, Red Nose Day, this was on P-Dub's uh, EMEA, uh, or the, which your team helps host and put together. Can you talk a little bit about uh, setting up the production environment and working with the teams? Uh, sure. As Ben mentioned, there are three separate PCFs that are stood up for this project. We ran two of them on GCP, uh, one out of Belgium and one out of South Carolina. Um, now, Ben mentioned the app developer side of the CF push contract and how it makes it very easy for them because nothing changes. It also made it really easy for us because we didn't have to do any negotiating with the app developers about the architecture of their app or everything they needed. We did a little bit of interaction with them initially to get their load tests and to make sure that we knew how to run them and we could run them effectively. And then we were able to focus on scaling the platform, making sure it was configured correctly, and running those load tests repeatedly to confirm that everything would go smoothly on the night. So it was a really smooth experience for us. And from the IaaS provider, uh, Jay, can you talk a little bit about uh, PCF on GCP and and how those are, have worked together in this event and, and, and generally? Yeah, absolutely. I think the event itself was actually kind of a, it was a great moment for us, first of all, to be associated uh, with such a program. Uh, but secondly, because we've been working for well over a year by that point uh, with Pivotal and also with contributing to the open source community, uh, amazing engineering team at Google that's been focused on the PCF on GCP integrations. And so from uh, price performance, compute storage networking, service brokers, hopefully you've attended some of our sessions this week. Uh, we've been doing a lot of meaningful work. But specific to this event, I think things like our uh, global load, load balancer. So we love to talk about this because uh, our global load balancer that you can use on GCP, it's the same thing that powers YouTube, it powers Gmail, okay? And you get that when you're running your applications on PCF. Now in the context of an event like this, why that matters, you know, 75 million pounds for us Americans in the room, that's like a lot of money. I think it's like 95 million bucks. So if you think about the number of transactions and the need to be able to scale instantly from zero, and what if it was 100 million? What if it was, unfortunately, 15 million, right? What are you doing to plan for what that front-end load balancer does? Okay, but when you're doing it on GCP, it's literally no ops, no infrastructure, API call, go from zero requests per second up to a million requests per second in seconds. So these are some of the things that we've been kind of embedding inside of the PCF on GCP implementation that allows you to do those kinds of things when you're running it on Google. So it was exciting because we knew, obviously, the load and the scale and everything that got the Red Nose Day would bring. So we were kind of sitting back like everybody else, like, OK, here we go. It's go time. But luckily, it was a pretty boring night. So oh, That's a, that's a good segue. Like, how yes. did the event go? We love boring nights on yeah, things exactly. like that. So thanks again for working with us. Boring are the best releases. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, 2011 was the first year that I joined Comic Relief and I worked on Red Nose Day. And it, I could say it's probably the single most exciting work experience that I've ever had. You know, it, it was a, after weeks of high stress and this event happened, lack of sleep, and just even the smallest thing that went wrong, just flew, I just flew off the handle. I didn't know what was going on and like eventually calmed down. And it was very, very exciting. Now it's really boring. 
and that is very, very good. You know, if anyone, anyone who works in kind of software development, works in operations, just knows what, how slightly dissatisfying it is when everything is really boring, but how great it is because it's undoubtedly uh, the best thing. And I'd just like to mention something else that, you know, that Ben uh, alluded to about the fact that, you know, the implementation with um, Cloud Foundry hasn't changed over six years. That's an amazing thing. And for me, you know, I'm a bit of a cynic. And when we first, when they first brought me Cloud Foundry, they said, oh, you know, we'll run across, you know, a multiple, uh, multiple infrastructure providers. I was like, yeah, of course it will, with loads and loads of work. But it just does work, you know. It really does what it says on the tin. And I think it's very easy at the pace that technology moves to take stuff for granted. But to be able to say that we built an application, not had to change anything about the integration to the kind of platform provision of it, and that it just works across multiple uh, infrastructure providers is an amazing thing. And it's very easy to take it for granted. That, just to, to kind of close it out, um, in general, what is this kind of meant for Comic Relief, and, and what are you looking forward to uh, going forward in the future? So I think, um, like Ben said, the most important thing was we take all the money, and we took all the money, and you know, at the moment, the, the total is approaching kind of 77 million pounds. You know, it takes a total of what we've raised uh, over our lifetime to about kind of one point, over 1.2 billion pounds. And that money has a real effect on people's lives. And, uh, and I'm incredibly proud of the team and what they've done and the difference that that's made in, to people's lives in the UK and across the world. And really for me, what it really proved to me was this, that, you know, by using the PaaS, you can allow your teams to focus their efforts on where the value is being added on that kind of app development. Uh, and it allows you to move so much quicker, it allows you to move, to really innovate on top of that, knowing that you've got kind of this rock solid foundation which you're, which you're kind of working with. So after we had the success, success with the donations platform, we've got a, a fundraising platform which is a slightly different, uh, different uh, thing. And we converted that from a kind of PHP monolith and started using, uh, pulling out some microservices of that and moved it to Cloud Foundry. And that just worked as well. That was running on, on PWS US and that, and that worked for our campaign. You know, we've got a few million dollars, a few million pounds through that as well. And so really, from my perspective as kind of uh, CTO, the kind of strategic direction really is to have Cloud Foundry as our kind of uh, baseline foundation for all our development. So we're slowly kind of migrating other apps and things over to it. Awesome. And that basically takes us to the end of what we wanted to talk about. But if you have questions for us, we can have a few more minutes. Uh, any, any questions? Tony. Yeah, so for this, this pattern for hydrating, for hydrating whole cloud foundries, can you, can you walk me through what the initial workflows were for like testing that you could bring up the cloud foundries and like, where you're taking them down on, on pipelines? Like, how was that working? Sure. So we wound up building a set of tooling. We knew we would need to create and tear down a number of production instances for our load test process. Um, so the first step for us was actually not to start bringing up a Cloud Foundry. It was to build tooling to bring up a Cloud Foundry so that we had that available. We knew the configuration was consistent and we could delete it at will since we didn't want a production scale thing for the entire you know, six month lead up to the project. Uh, yeah, I think we had enough lead time that we, we had a pretty clear picture of where we needed to be um, and a sense of what we would need to do to get there and we were able to plan a, effectively to get to that point. So it's actually been, uh, not subsumed is not the right word, but preempted by the customer zero pipelines that are being made available for a very similar purpose. Uh, we were building them in parallel with customer zero since we needed them before they would become available, but that's the canonical source for this, this type of work. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. How long did it take to go from once you commit a change to production? Um, hmm. So, um, does it change? I guess it depends. So it depends on your components. So some components have slightly longer uh, test phases. Um, but I'd say it's about um, 30 minutes per, per environment. So we t tend to have two. So a commit would probably get to production within two hours, I would say. Um, and I say like everything is continuous um, deployment. So every commit will get to production if it doesn't you know, fail any of the testing. Yeah. Uh, so over the, the week or the 24 hours that really matters, do you 
you have a, a, a war room, you're like, what's what's that look like at that at that sort of moment of truth in time? What are you what are you measuring? So we um uh, so we've got offices in Vauxhall in London, uh, right next to the MI6 building. So if you guys have watched any of the James Bond movies, that building that blew up, where uh, right right next door to that, um, uh, which might be an apt restriction from some of the uh, earlier campaigns that we had, but for, from a technical point of view, but more recently they've been better. So we have um, we get the Armakuni guys, and this year we had the pivotal guys as well, uh, David Lang's team, um, in the office with us, and we set up a room. We've got lots of kind of uh, boards with uh, loads of kind of charts and, and graphs and things uh, going on. We also have a, a kind of a, a, a dashboard which shows the uh, shows the amount of money that's coming in where it's coming in from and kind of overlays the previous years and all that so we're watching that constantly and we use that to provide feedback to the um broadcast uh show so we say this particular film it got this response it did that you might want to consider rerunning that at 11 30 and, and all those kind of things so having kind of a constant feedback loop so we have a large kind of uh, operations team i'd say and operations more generic operations has kind of finance teams and all that in one room then we have the guys who are running the donations platform in the other room and and everyone's got their screens up and watching particular particular kind of graphs and particular bits of information, watching payment service provider response times, what's happening with those, any kind of latest, any outliers that are happening for, for them to go and investigate any kind of, uh, we have a, a person who's directly in contact with the call center if people are phoning up and having particular issues, if any of our, so we've got, kind of 120 companies who give us their time for free and they have call centers where people phone up to, to, to give money. So we have contacts from them coming into us if they're, they're noticing any particular issues or any particular problems. And so, yeah, it's quite, um, it's quite an intense evening. Yeah, um, I guess from an application point of view, that's a really key part that all those elements, all those external third party dependencies are, you know, wrapped in in metrics and and we see fluctuations in, in how um, they're behaving before anyone else does. So, um, and we can start to load balance away from certain provi providers or we can um, upscale ones that are particularly quick um, just so we can get that feedback loop as short as possible so we can get users giving money as quickly as possible. And it's also worth saying that we have kind of, uh, we've got built a great relationship with those payment service providers and other third party suppliers that we rely on and we usually have kind of open calls with them. So if we need to jump onto them, they've got kind of support teams kind of supporting us during the event. I think it's funny that you say that because I know uh, David Lang, uh, one of Murray's ca counterparts, uh, he actually had a quote and it was kind of funny more the way he said it. Uh, he said, you know, it, it just worked and that was kind of it, right? So when I mentioned about the load balancer example of zero to a million requests per second, you know, it, even as huge as the transaction counts were, that's what was nice about it is we kind of knew up front it wasn't going to risk threatening, you know, any kind of uh, introducing any latency issues or things like that. So, yeah, it was actually, like I said, it was a very calm night. And from the past for us, for the load balancers, um, I gather that there was some pre-warming necessary for other IASs that wasn't necessary on GCP. And so we did some validation. It, it was great. Um, and we didn't need to do any additional work there. Um, I guess just one more point on that is that um, like we have some really great partners and we have really great support and they're on the phone and they need that support, but the whole platform is optimized not to need that support. So whenever we're um, being offered that support, if anything special can we do, can we do something behind the scenes to do some tweaking? Generally, no. Just like we, we actively stay away from that. We just want to hit an API. We just want the same service that everyone else gets. And if we can't achieve what we need to achieve with that, then we need to rethink it. We don't want people snowflaking somewhere, something behind the scenes, doing some pre-warming, doing a little bit of config change. We don't want that. We want reproducible, continuous deployment, everything is code. Great, any other questions? No, well, thanks again for sticking it out with us, y'all. I uh, hope you had a great conference, and we'll see you next time.